Thanks a lot, Annes. Good morning again. Um, yeah, I think there is no Phosphor-G conference uh, without a talk on Inspire, so that's the one for this year. Um, I'm speaking on behalf of the Inspire JRC team. Um, there's uh, Jordi, uh, my colleague here, and Alex. Uh, it's a talk on the vision uh, for Inspire. So it's a talk on the future, how Inspire should evolve from a, st a standard, traditional SDI to a modern uh, data ecosystem. Let me start with a quick introduction on Inspire, if there's someone with, uh, with, which is less uh, familiar with, uh, with that. So Inspire is a directive, first of all. It's in force since 2007, and uh, um, it defined the legal, uh, technical, and organizational framework um, to basically create a European uh, spatial data infrastructure in support of environmental policies. Probably Inspire is the largest geospatial data sharing effort that has been ever undertaken. In a nutshell, it defines requirements for interoperability on data, on services, and on metadata. And it's not something to be built from scratch, but it is to be created by making interoperable the special data infrastructures that already existed at the member state level. More practically speaking, uh, Inspire is complemented by other legally binding documents called the implementing rules, which define what the member states must do, again, in relation uh, to the three components of metadata, data, so we have conceptual data models in Inspire, and network services. In Inspire, we have discovery services to discover the data through metadata. We have view services uh, to view, to access the data, and download services to download the data. Then we have the technical guidelines, which are uh, not legally binding, but again, they say, they specify for the three components from the technical point of view how member states can implement uh, the legal requirements. Now, uh, there are at least three reasons why we are here today to speak about the future of Inspire. The first is the end of the Inspire legal roadmap that was initially defined, and the need to inform the revision of the directive that will happen um, in the near future. The fact that there is a new uh, political context in the EU where uh, priority number one is the Green Deal, the environment, and um, the fact that we have a new, a completely new technical uh, context, technological context uh, compared to 2007 when Inspire was initially adopted. So we feel this is uh, the right moment for us as the GRC. GRC is the technical coordinator of Inspire to first reflect on the state of play and the lessons learned from the Inspire implementation happened so far and then based on the new context, uh, policy context, uh, technological context to present our vision on how we can modernize, we can streamline the infrastructure and also some concrete actions to achieve that. Of course, all of these uh, by also thinking to the role that open source, that OSGEO can, can play. So let me start from the state of play, the lessons learned that will be of course both positive and negative. And the first one is actually a negative one. Inspire implementation is still heterogeneous in Europe. There is no single member state that has reached full implementation. <clears throat> but at the same time, we can observe uh, that the number of data sets that are made available by member states, uh, currently around 80, 85,000, and also the level of interoperability of the data sets is increasing on a daily basis, is a continuous process. So, Inspire should be seen really as more as a process rather than as a final product. This is uh, what we have seen. Now, <clears throat> I said before that uh, Inspire should ideally be based, uh, uh, be built on top of the infrastructures from member states. That is what you see on the right. But what has sometimes happened in the past is what you see on the left. That is, member states have built parallel infrastructures. Um, often they share only a limited amount of data sets that they have at the national level, and that is in scope of the directive. Um, for example, they may not want to create metadata for all the data sets, or to harmonize all the data sets, or to set up services for all the data sets. Um, the main reason uh, is that the requirements are different for, from Inspire and at the national level. Data models are different. Inspire requires additional, for example, service uh, metadata that are not already provided by the software used at the national level, and so on and so forth. But the result, whatever is the reason, the result is that we have a patchwork of available data. Often we have data with different scale, granularity, spatial coverage, um, license, um, and um, some are not harmonized uh, yet. And this, of course, uh, is an obstacle for not just interoperability, but even pan-European coverage. 
And we also experienced issues with usability. We have observed, for example, cases of services serving huge amounts of data sets that are almost impossible to consume for clients or services that are not monitored and that are, that are always or often or sometimes down. Now, next point is governance. Um, Inspire, since the beginning, was conceptualized with a very inclusive and open uh, governance approach in mind, um, involving stakeholders since the very initial draft of the technical guidance, which of course is key, was key to ensure the future success of the implementation. Today, the main governance body is the MIG, we love acronyms, of course, the Maintenance and Implementation Group, um, that is the body where all member states are represented and that deals with all kinds of organizational, legal, and technical matters. The issue here is that the MIG is exclusively represented by data providers. And as Anne said, change is hard. It takes time. So it has not always been flexible and fast enough to accommodate changes and novelties in the infrastructure. That is exactly why a couple of years ago we started to introduce new, flexible, agile governance approaches to actually change to evolve the infrastructure. Uh, so the idea was to come up with community-driven approaches and to operationalize them using online platforms, and mainly GitHub, that we are now strongly using in Inspire. Let me mention two examples. The first is the good practices, that is the way that we introduce to include new approaches like new standards, new technologies for data encoding, data sharing in Inspire. On the Right, you see what are the currently uh, candidate and endorsed Inspire good practices. You may, for example, see Inspire, sorry, OGC API features that is already um, usable by member states to serve data in Inspire. And there is a governance process that specifies how to propose, how to discuss, how to provide feedback, and finally, how to endorse a good practice. Similarly, um, we define a governance approach for the artifacts that are the technical guidelines, so the very same technical documents on Inspire implementation, the schemas, and the UML models. Again, we, there are different GitHub repositories that uh, operationalize the whole workflow from the initial proposal to the feedback, uh, the discussion, the endorsement, and the final implementation of the changes. Moving now to software, uh, here you see uh, what we call the uh, Inspire central infrastructure components that are the software tools that the GRC uh, develops and maintains and operates on a daily basis to make Inspire implementation possible. Uh, so you see the Inspire GeoPortal, that is the point of access to all the data shared by uh, member states under Inspire, the Inspire Reference Validator that offers uh, tests to check the compliance of data, metadata, and services, and the Inspire Registry that manages all the identifiers uh, in Inspire. Um, what is important to say is that they are all based on open source components. From the right to the left, the Inspire Registry is based on the registry, open source software. The Reference Validator is based on the ETF uh, framework, and uh, the Inspire GeoPortal is currently in the process of being migrated to GeoNetwork uh, open source. If you're interested, there will be dedicated talks uh, to each of these components. So the one on the GeoPortal is exactly here after the keynote, after the coffee break, so in one hour. And the other two, ETF and registry, are tomorrow, just one after uh, the other. So if we look at the uh, software used by member states to implement Inspire, you can see some few uh, proprietary solutions, and you can uh, also and uh, especially see open source projects and a lot of those geo um, projects. We could probably say that almost uh, these, uh, all of these solutions have uh, implemented at a certain point some specific functionality because of Inspire. So either to uh, provide ETL functionality, for example, to harmonize the data, or to serve the data, or to consume uh, the data. So Inspire is agnostic from the technological perspective, but uh, it has always been strongly based on international standards, mainly from the OGC. Probably Inspire implementation represents the largest uptake of OGC standards ever. And of course, using standards benefits uh, everyone, not just the users and the providers, but also the standardization bodies themselves, because they get feedback from the implementation, they can improve the standards, standards there is an uptake, um, because of the participation of Inspire representatives in the technical committees of the standardization bodies. Sometimes we have experienced problems, uh, for example, due to the mismatch between a standard and the existing implementation of, of that standard. So the lesson learned here is that uh, 
it is very important to um, consider only standards that are already mature, already well used by the community for Inspire, of course. So not just standards that satisfy the legal requirements, but that really add value to the technological stack of the data providers, and of course, that especially that make it easier for users to actually use the data. Now, uh, something else that uh, we learned from the implementation of Inspire is that the technical infrastructure is only as good as the social infrastructure underpinning it. Uh, in a similar way as the Phosphor-G community, we also rely on a very active uh, community in Inspire, mainly composed of um, representatives of the public sector, but also we have the private sector, we have academia, we have other organizations. The community meets at the annual um, Inspire conference, you can see on the, on the map uh, where the conference has happened in the past. Unfortunately, no conference in the last few years due to COVID. Now, something that didn't really work in Inspire was the assumption done at the very beginning that the requirements that were created at the beginning and that were not yet supported by existing software and libraries would lead to the evolution of those software uh, and libraries. Uh, to support them, but this actually not always happened, and I can mention two examples. The first is the support that is still limited to complex GML datasets in uh, GIS clients, and the second is the support for the extended capabilities of Inspire network services in uh, GIS servers. So the lesson learned is always to make sure that the technical requirements, even the possibly future ones, can be already implemented by solutions out of the box, of course, by solutions that already exist. And then we have the licensing issue. There is a um, high uh, heterogeneity in licensing approaches that are uh, adopted by the different member states and sometimes even by different providers within the same member state. Um, of course, the result is that not just, uh, not all inspired data is open data, but it's even worse in the sense that a number of different and non-standard licenses are used, which of course uh, pose uh, an obstacle to the actual reuse and uptake of the data. So how to solve this? It's not an easy one to solve. We need a common European approach uh, based on a standard uh, licensing framework such as Creative Commons, and this is what the Open Data Directive, uh, that is a directive uh, from 2019, uh, is and will uh, try to solve at least for some of the data sets. Now, let me uh, quickly zoom on the context, uh, political context and technological context that were actually the future of Inspire should, should happen. And uh, speaking about uh, uh, policy context, uh, um, we need to mention the European Strategy for Data. That is a, a document um, from 2020 that you see at the top right. It's an important one because it envisions um, the establishment of a European single market for data to uh, exploit the whole potential of European data provided by different um, actors, and it uh, um, anticipates some legal documents that you see on the, on the left. Um, just to mention some, these are important for data sharing in general, with, of course, impacts on Inspire. And these um, address the licensing, as I mentioned before, there's the Open Data Directive and an upcoming implementing regulation on high-value data sets and also the governance of uh, data sharing, in data sharing. Um, I can mention the, op the Data Governance Act and also the Data uh, Act. Finally, uh, the strategy is also envisioning uh, the birth of so-called European data spaces that uh, uh, in, in all strategic uh, societal sectors in order to ensure and improve data sovereignty in Europe. And of course, among these sectors, there's also the environment and um, the data space is called the European Green Deal data space. And this, of course, is where Inspire will have a, a role. From the technological point of view, of course, we are speaking about a completely different situation compared to 2007. We don't or no longer have only the data from the public sector. We currently have a huge number of new data sources and actors that we should consider. We have uh, private data, we have uh, data from the Internet of Things, we have Earth observation data, of course, uh, Copernicus here plays a key role in Europe. We have citizen-generated data, a uh, thing to OpenStreetMap, which is increasingly considered, uh, even by some governments, citizen science projects. We have open research data. Um, research data is extremely important, and there's an increasing um, attention to the FAIR, the findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable uh, principles. Not just data, of course, but technology in general that we should consider. Uh, first uh, and foremost, APIs, 
web-based APIs, modern APIs, um, agile standards that are co-created by different actors. Uh, again, think to OGC APIs, think to Stack, for example, for data sharing, for encoding, think to GeoPackage, think to cloud-optimized GeoTIFF, for example. We have more and more mature tools to, to serve the data, to use the data, to ETL the data. And we have novel architectures, um, federated cloud infrastructures. Here I can mention GaiaX, that is a promising example in Europe, uh, edge and fog infrastructures. We have specifications like solid to improve the uh, portability of data. So with all these ingredients, let's come finally to the vision. Uh, there is a vision for the future of Inspire, but for the future of any SDI. So we can extend this, we can generalize this. First point, data sharing is not a goal in itself. It is a means to an end, and the end is always to take better decisions, uh, to innovate, uh, to uh, improve citizens' life. In order to remain fit for purpose uh, for the current uh, European policy context and to be sustainable in the long term, we believe that Inspire, again, and SDIs in general, should blend in with the broader uh, IT ecosystem of spatial but also non-spatial data policies, infrastructures, uh, technologies. Only in this way, we believe Inspire uh, can really attract a broader community and uh, can address an increasing number and a different number of use cases and, and applications. Of course, this means that we should first of all, well, we should find ways to lower the entry barrier to the infrastructure. Uh, we should come up with more open, more agile governance approaches. We should facilitate the technical complexity of the SDI. How to achieve this in practice? We have a number of actions from the legal, the organizational, and the technical perspective. And of course, based on what I said before, um, we are, I mean, it's clear that we are already working on many of them. Uh, you, will, you will recognize uh, where. From the legal perspective, first of all is that legislation should avoid over-specification. So technical details, um, technical complexity should be always left out from legislation, which didn't really happen in Inspire so that when technology evolves, legislation can stay the same. And then the use of a simple licensing framework, as I mentioned before, based on a common, a standard uh, licensing uh, framework. Organizational um, uh, actions, here we speak about governance. We don't want a top-down approach. We don't want a bottom-up approach. We want a decentralized approach, uh, shared across multiple levels, uh, based on co-design, agile, where multiple actors, and again, not only uh, the public sector can interact with each other and can generate value. Of course, this is where we see a role for OSGEO. Um, OSGEO is a strategic partner for us. We are already working and collaborating on a number of aspects. Again, at, follow the other presentations if you want to know more. But is, this is where we actually see an important role in the future, in this ecosystem. Finally, technological actions. Of course, uh, uh, we should continue uh, improving uh, discoverability, accessibility, interoperability of data, uh, ensure technological neutrality. We um, want to avoid vendor lock-in. Of course, um, all the standards and technologies that uh, we include should be well adopted, already mature. Avoid custom extensions of standards so that the requirements can be covered by already existing uh, software implementations. And again, uh, we are pushing, as uh, GISCO is doing, on the use of APIs, because really APIs uh, are the key to make Inspire and SDIs uh, accessible and usable, not just by geospatial experts, as it was in the past for traditional SDIs, but to everyone. Optimizing data for, or data discoverability for search engines, because again, um, everyone, or even more and more people, non-geospatial people, look for data using search engines. And finally, leverage on the on developments of federated uh, European cloud infrastructures. I mentioned GaiaX. We have just uh, concluded the first pilot uh, looking at the uh, feasibility of using uh, GaiaX, uh, which does not yet really exist in an operational uh, way for the purposes of Inspire. Very last slide to mention that uh, we have written a report uh, in the broader uh, context of the European Green Deal uh, with colleagues from the Commission and uh, from GeoNovum, uh, the Netherlands. Again, we reflect in this report on lessons learned from Inspire, uh, our experience and our vision for the future. So of course, the detail will be a bit higher than the one I gave in the presentation. There's the link here, but if you are interested, there are also some uh, paper uh, printed copies uh, here. So feel free just to uh, pass and keep one uh, at the end if you are interested. And that's it. Thank you. <laughs>